listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. In a world where one-size-fits-all medications dominate the pharmaceutical industry, Precision Medicine brings a ray of hope for those seeking customized health care. Pharmacists have a unique opportunity to help people in need of specialized testing to ensure medications work as intended. Welcome to Precision Health in PGX, where we unravel the wonders of precision medicine and its potential to revolutionize the way we approach pharmacy care. Get ready to uncover the secrets behind pharmacogenomics and how it's transforming lives one genome at a time. Hey, this is an exciting opportunity for the Pharmacy Podcast Network as we continuously level up, as continuously change content to fit the needs of our uh, pharmacists. Roles are evolving in pharmacy. Pharmacists are taking on roles that we've Never thought of before uh, with the uh, intense uh, amount of information and education that's coming in from multiple sources of supplements and science and artificial intelligence. Pharmacogenomics has always been incredibly fascinating to me. I was so excited to meet up with Dr. Benaz Sarami and Dr. Becky Winslow, who took command of PGX for Pharmacists. And now it's evolving as um, the role of pharmacists are evolving as well. And uh, with that, I'd like to bring on um, Dr. Becky Winslow and Dr. Benaz Sarami and announcing our new show. I guess we could call it an evolution. And, yes, um, <laughs> definitely. I'm going to turn it over to Becky and just announce to the Pharmacy Podcast Network um, uh, some of the alterations and changes and enhancements that we're making. Thanks, Todd, for the introduction. You're absolutely correct. Uh, we've been hanging out together, talking about pharmacogenomics for quite a few years now. And just like we evolved uh, the PGX for Pharmacists podcast uh, into an educational platform not so many years ago, we're proud and happy to announce that we're going to expand on the PGX for Pharmacists podcast. We have rebranded as the Precision Health and PGX podcast, which is exciting for us because we've been dying to talk to you about um, more expansive topics. Um, we're not uh, straying from PGX for pharmacists. Not at all. But we are going to be bringing you a much broader um, information uh, topics so that, um, yeah, so we're we're evolving just like the practice of, of pharmacy has evolved for pharmacists. Benaz? Yeah, that's correct. It's, uh, you know, the forefront of healthcare innovation. We're really, again, still doing PGX, but kind of broadening the uh, type of guests we bring in. So we'll bring you more information on precision health as a whole, which I think is really great. Yep. That's awesome. All yeah. right. Well, I'm turning the show over to you as the professionals. I'm going to get out of here. I am not the pharmacist <laughs> nor the physician or the scientist. So um, I'm so excited about you bringing on such high level and intelligent guests to really um, dive into some of these topics that pharmacists really want to hear and nerd out on. So with that, I hope you um, are, are anything that you need. Let me know along the way, of course, but we're excited to uh, introduce uh, your first guest. So away we go. Yeah, we're excited to have uh, Dr. Jason Kafer on, and he's an assistant professor of clinical psychiatry at University of Missouri, Columbia. He is certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Urology and also the American Board of Preventative Medicine. His prior clinical experience include working at an inpatient psychiatry at Fulton State Hospital and outpatient uh, at Comprehensive Health System. In 2007, he founded Iconic Health, which is a medical informatics startup that obtained angel round uh, funding. He was also the principal investigator for phase one and two small business uh, innovation research, uh, grants for online rural, rural telepsychiatry platform that was funded by the United States Department of Agriculture. He's, Dr. Kafer is also an inventor of the United States patent, which um, was a subject of an SBIR grant awarded by the Department of 
um, Health and Human Services for medication iconograph, I, I hope I said that right, visualization of complex medication regimen. He, he has an amazing website and books written such as Kiefer's Psychopharmacology. Um, I, I could take up the whole entire podcast talking about you, Dr. Kiefer, but I'll let you introduce yourself and just tell us how you um, came about this amazing path of iconograph, if I say that correctly. Okay. Um, sure. Yes. Um, haven't talked about some of uh, those things for a while. It's uh, sort of my, my distant past, but starting, um, I guess, near the end of my residency at University of Missouri, Columbia, about... 20 years ago, I um, had this startup venture that was uh, called Iconic Health, and it was this uh, platform for online telepsychiatry uh, with a, an electronic medical record that incorporated some, um, some visuals to, uh, to help process um, medication management, essentially. Um, and uh, it's essentially, it was, it, was a, uh, it was a big bust. I mean, we, uh, we did raise a lot of money and we, we made some progress on it, but it's been an abandoned idea. But I'll, I'll show you the, yes, the, the innovation that was in that. I can go ahead and yes, cue this one up. Okay, so the, these are iconographs. They, they never got made, um, but they are a data visualization tool for a medication regimen. And so envision these little stamp sized um, iconographs on, on a screen, uh, one of each uh, for a medication in the, the patient's uh, list that, that tell you several pieces of information, uh, some of it uh, reference material about the medication, some of it in the patient's relation to the medication, like, hey, how big of a dose is this really, in case mm -hmm. the prescriber may not be familiar with a certain medication. Uh, how long have they been been taking it? Uh, what's their impression of it? Are they compliant with it? This sort of thing. But I've always been fascinated with uh, pharmacokinetics. And you know, 20 years ago, I thought they were impossible to to learn to memorize. And so, hey, I want these. I want these on my screen. I want I want my computer to tell me what's the effect of these these medications together. And so. On the Lamotrigine iconograph, there have got some arrows uh, pointing downward, which is uh, reflects that induction effect of carbamazepine on the metabolism of Lamotrigine. And also, we um, it, also this would display uh, metabolizer status. So, if they were a poor metabolizer of um, uh, UGT one A four that metabolizes Lamotrigine, there would be some up arrows there. So, just kind of that bar at the left is the, yes, relative dose. And yeah, this is something I really haven't thought about at all for 10 years, but that's, oh, what, wow. <laughs> that's what this is about. Um, and so, uh, and so since, since this idea never came to fru fruition, uh, my next step was, okay, I, I got to deal with these interactions <laughs> as a prescriber. So I guess I just need to learn them. And so <laughs> I devised a, yes, a method to do so. And oh, so is this the first time you're, we, Everyone's seeing it for after ten years, so we feel very privileged. It's been what's well, happening. yeah, no, it, it, nobody's seen it for probably yeah. Oh, for 10, that's awesome. Ten years, I don't think anybody's talked about it. Oh, nice. okay, wow, just right here on Precision Health and PGX podcast. That's of it. That's yeah. awesome. I love it. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, do you have any more slides from ten years ago? We'd love to see it. Ah, uh, there. So <laughs> it was. You know, we should have, we tried to do too much. Okay. So we should have just gone with the online telepsychiatry platform uh, because we had this very, I mean, internet video wasn't very good back then, nothing like mm -hmm. this. Uh, and so we just had a very primitive portal. And I did do some, some online telepsych back then, one, one of the first people to, to do it. And wow. um, that, but, you know, we just tried to, yeah, to, to put in so much so much technology in it, and you can yeah you can blow a lot of money really fast. Okay, sure, um, for sure. So, are you um, applying genetics data to uh, with that, or how are you using? Well, or back we're going then, to use that. So yes, back then it, it would have been incorporated in the 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 visualized medication list. So yes, it would have would have been uh, would have been in there. So okay. uh, as well as these things get incorporated into EMRs. Sure. I mean, most most EMRs don't really incorporate that data right now. I know at the mm -hmm. at the VA they they do. Uh, 
I, I'm told they do a pretty good job of it there. That is part of the medication ordering process that if there are pharmaco um, genetic factors that, mm -hmm. that yeah, will we'll be alerted to those. Nice. But okay. a lot of charts, a lot of them know. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us about your, your book. All right. So anyway, this is uh, Visualize to Memorize 270 Medication Mascots. Um, and so things I'll be talking about here are the things in the first book, Medication Mascots and Interaction Avatars. And then um, at the end, I, I want to give a preview of uh, these uh, molecules that are uh, going to be in, in the second edition that I'm writing this year, hopefully to come out next year. Hopefully uh, we get a signed copy. Okay. Yes, certainly. Okay, thank you. Thank Please. You. Now this is exciting because I'm a visual learner. So if you can show it to me, then I'll, I will get it faster. So I'm excited about this. Yeah, me, I'm a visual learner to the extreme. Uh -huh. And um, mm -hmm. it's interesting. So we have been interviewing uh, pharmacy residents for the, uh, I'm a preceptor for the uh -huh. Uh, pharmacist through Fulton State Hospital, and I always ask them, "Hey, what do you? Wh how do you? How do you mm -hmm. learn? What what sort of mnemonics do you use, or what sort of visual?" And they just don't have any, um, <laughs> which is really amazing. Now, with physicians, I mean, all the medical students are subscribed to these um, uh, sketchy and picmonic. They're car right. called the UC's Memory Palace, like techniques mm -hmm. to to yeah memorize a bunch of information mm -hmm. and. It just amazes me. Uh, pharmacists amaze me. They they just memorize. It's like their brains are different than ours. Well, had we like known that. about this, but, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, medication mascots. So the idea is that every medication has uh, its representative that ideally would bring a couple things in, in uh, uh, for your memory here. So we've got uh, dueling symbols here for Cymbalta, mm -hmm. duoxetine. So if if you know you somebody says Cymbalta and you can remember this, you can pair and oh yeah, that's that's duoxetine. And so ideally, the, the mascot also would uh, convey some piece of information about the med. In this case, it can be um, hepatotoxic. And so we've got uh, lumetepirone cap lighter, uh, illuminated cap lighter. Uh, cool. comes in four, oh 40, 42 milligrams. I'm catching on. I'm catching on. <laughs> um, so antipsychotics, they're represented by spooky mascots. So that's another piece of information that's in here. So that's Sarah, quit typing. Um, Seroquel is really good for uh, mania. So, you know, yes. get typing. Did, did these just come to you or like, I could never have thought about that. The Sarah. I've been the Sarah. Yeah, typing. I, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been doing this since residency also, oh, okay. um, just very slowly, just, yeah, adding adding mnemonics this way. Okay. Um, and then recently, I'm getting pretty decent with the uh, artificial intelligence yeah. um, image creation. And so this is one that I made um, through through that. So uh, Brex Piperzole. Uh, so it's a, not a T-Rex, but a B-Rex. Brex okay. um, Salty. And he's got some salt. Oh. Uh, wow. Lots of interactions with this one, fluvoxamine. So Lovox, Gluvox, uh, Carbamazepine, lots of interactions with this one, as you know. So uh, Tegretol, Tiger Tail, and the Car Maze. So uh, when I show you these avatars, the, the ones that have a tiger theme are related to Carbamazepine. Okay. Um, and again, it's just directionality that's I, I've always been terrified of directionality with interaction. So if it's if it's something that I need to be giving 50 percent dose of something and I get the, the direction wrong, I'm going to be giving 200 percent of what I'm supposed yeah. to do it and really have a horrible situation. Uh, so I was like, I got to memorize these. And, um, you know, when it comes to the concept of enzyme induction, OK, we're making more of an enzyme. Uh, and so it's just a, a couple mental steps to go through. But for me, it's like, okay, let's simplify it. It's just up and down. All right. Mm -hmm. So if I've got an inhibitor, it's going to increase levels of stuff. So inhibition, high and hurried. And induction, it's going to decrease. So it's a down arrow, down and delayed. So that's what the loading icon is for. So it's going to be delayed while your, your liver is ramping up production of, of more enzymes. Okay. Uh, interaction avatars. Um, so this is for SIP 182, and I've got, uh, you know, um, word mnemonics for all these two. So one X to grind is how I decided, okay, this was going to be an X. So anything that is a, um, is a SIP 182 inducer is going to be represented as an X, and that's going to decrease 
levels of anything that's a tree. So any okay. 182 substrate would be a tree. So we've got carbamazepine now with a tiger theme. It's the tiger X. Um, and, you know, one of the trees could be the Cymbalta tree. So duloxetine, it's a substrate. Anything that's an ax is going to chop down anything that's a tree. Tobacco, chopping down the tree also. And, um, <laughs> and so about 52% of individuals are 1A2 rapid metabolizers. So they have this, this effect too. And so, uh, you know, when you count them and you count the smokers, I mean, yes. a lot of, most everybody's a 1A2 rapid <laughs> metabolizer. And this is one of the things I, you know, I see on these, these pharmacogenetic test reports that people get all excited about when somebody's a 1A2 rapid metabolizer, but it's, yeah, that's kind of a nothing burger. There's one that are, <laughs> nothing that, are more, burger. that are more important that I'll show you. All right. Uh, 3A4, 3A's for fishing. So this is over half of uh, prescription drugs, I'm told, are 3A4 substrates to some extent. Um, and now when it comes to representing them, you got to figure out, okay, what's clinically relevant. If it's clinically yes. relevant, I want to make a visual for it. If mm -hmm. not, I want to not. So uh, anything that's a bobber is going to increase levels of anything that's a fish. So phloboxamine okay. is increasing quetiapine. And here's the uh, lumateperone. I plugged that jack-o'-lantern in here. So that's a fish. <laughs> so anything that's a bobber is going to increase levels of lumateperone. And uh, the opposite, uh, induction. So uh, down and delayed, basically you're dropping anvils on top of the fish and making them go down. Mm -hmm. So carbamazepine decreases quetiapine about sixfold. Um, and this is one of the, just the most neglected interactions I see. I see all the time mm -hmm. carbamazepine and quetiapine or lorazidone or this next one, uh, lumateperone again. So uh, mm -hmm. 20 fold decrease. It's an expensive drug. And I see this all the time and pharmacists mm -hmm. don't call us about it. Um, but this is, uh, yes, one that, that I've memorized. So for the last one with Sarah in the car, mm -hmm. yeah, wait, was it not car? See, you're Sarah, quit typing, quit typing. <laughs> yeah. She's so a, you, the, a you, yeah. So the two of them, you're saying we shouldn't, uh, do together. So Sarah, you can say Sarah doesn't want to be in a car or Sarah doesn't like to drive a car. I don't know. You're making yeah. me now think like you. Oh my God. <laughs> or, okay, yeah. The, uh, so carbamazepine has always got to be the tiger. Always got to be a tiger. So, so Dr. Okay, Kafer, Dr. Kafer, I have to share with you that, um, for the last five, six years, I've been creating educational content around pharmacogenomics and I have, it'll be sad to compare to your pictures, but you have put my PowerPoint um, uh, smart arts to shame <laughs> because thus far, that's what I've used is however I can use a smart art to try to represent these interactions. And I'm not, I'll, I'm not certain they were always the clearest to anyone besides me. So kudos to you for absolutely for making it uh, much simpler. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. Yes. Uh, I don't want to say to generate these. So it's, um, I, uh, so it's a matter of a lot of Photoshop and I use Wombo sure. by dream mm -hmm. and I just kind of feed the images into Wombo and yeah, just kind of keep feeding them in until it, it gets, yeah, it gets something that until it, it, until it rings the bell. Right? Yeah. It's like, okay, that's <laughs> just a, a lot of work. I couldn't do That's it. a cool fish. Yeah. But it's fun. Um, all right. So more now with the pharmacogenomics. Um, so, you know, and I, I see the, the best way for prescribers wanting to understand, um, pharmacogenomics is to un first understand the, the medication interactions. And then, and then just, uh, you know, when it comes to the, the pharmacokinetic genes, mm -hmm. at least, and then that'll give you the context to understanding these uh, metabolizer phenotypes. So we've got, um, all right, 2D6. So any, anything that's a pump is going to be increasing the levels of anything that's a beach ball. And not, not all these 2D substrates are beach balls. Some of them are bowling balls. Okay. So these are, these would be the. <laughs> 2D6 <laughs> pro drugs. And it's going to have the opposite effect. It's just simply going to make it not work. Um, there's no such thing as a an inducer of 2D6, but um, we've got uh, rapid metabolizers of 2D6. Uh, we got poor metabolizers. And so their beach balls, 
Uh, if you're a normal metabolizer, the air leaves the beach ball at a normal rate. If you're an ultra rapid, it's leaving um, much quicker. And if you're a poor metabolizer, your beach balls get inflated. So more of the drug uh, because of uh, your uh, genotype. Mm-hmm. And so how this could apply to uh, Rex Alti, B-Rex, the B Tyrannosaurus Rex. So uh, normal metabolizers, normal blood levels you'd expect for a rapid metabolizer, you would expect that the blood levels to be smaller. And for poor metabolizers, it's going to be double. And the label recommends that you cut the dose in, in half mm-hmm. uh, in that event. Uh, also, poor metabolizers um, are not going to have a good time probably with uh, tramadol and codeine. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, they just don't work because you're not converting codeine to morphine or uh, converting tramadol to whatever you call the, the active form of mm-hmm. tramadol. And uh, th- this is one thing I kind of, I, that I think is kind of fun. If, you, if I suspect, um, like, for instance, if somebody's allergic, if you see they're allergic to tramadol and codeine, yes. uh, that's that's a pretty good sign they might be a 2D6 poor metabolizer because they're just getting all the side effects without any of the benefits. Um, and they they speculate that Elvis might have died because he was a, a 2D6 poor metabolizer. There was a pod, oh. uh, Carlet podcast where they, yes. they discussed this and so he, he was getting a lot of, Elvis was getting a lot of prescription medications. Um, and they found um, after he died, uh, for all of them, he had pretty much normal level. So mm-hmm. he was taking them as prescribed. There wasn't an overdose, but he had a extremely high codeine level okay. uh, with, with a very, with a very uh, high codeine to morphine ratio. And so mm-hmm. it was speculated that maybe because he was a 2D6 uh, poor metabolizer. That's what what did him in was all this this codeine that didn't get metabolized. That's um, that just illustrates uh, the relationship between um, inducers, inhibitors, metabolizer status, and toxicology reports. So, yes, um, in toxicology, I've often been asked, "How does this person have so much of the parent drug still, <laughs> um, you know, present in the specimen?" Um, and very little of the um, active uh, substrates. So absolutely, that's how it ties together. Yeah, exactly. And I, I don't see why anybody's prescribing codeine anyway, but. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, okay, uh, and some more, this one's relevant to psychiatry because several of our antidepressants are uh, 2C19 substrates, so 2C nice things grow. Um, anything that is a watering can grows flowers. So uh, fluvoxamine will increase blood levels of uh, CYP2C19 substrates like escitalopram, which is one we prescribe quite a bit. Um, the tricyclics that can be kind of dangerous if, uh, if you have this sort of interaction. And here's some visuals for, um, yeah, poor metabolizers and ultra rapid metabolizers here. So uh, poor metabolizers, anything that's a a flower, 2C19 substrate, they're going to be growing growing more flowers. Um, and uh, the ultra-rapid metabolizers are just going to be chopping the flowers down. <laughs> Lots of pictures. That's awesome. Probably, That's you know, awesome. A lot, a lot of pictures. Yeah. And examples that would be especially relevant are tricyclic antidepressants. Oh, my gosh. I would not have thought about it. Put a tricyclic. Tris- Wait, no, I can't even say that. Tricycle. TCAs, TCAs, yeah. yeah. I know the tricycle, the bicycle, not the bicycle. Tricycle. Yes, <laughs> that's that's awesome. As far as the 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 tiger tail and the car maze, the the other visual I have amid the tiger is a car, so it's a yeah tiger car. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a there is a car. You didn't just imagine that. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. All right, and uh, one other thing I want to uh, show you is, are my ideas for. Um, uh, pharmacodynamics of of psychiatric medications, um, and so, the, and this this is not in the current book, but it's going to be in the second edition. So, uh, you you're familiar with the uh, molecules from uh, Stephen Stahl, Stahl's Essential Psychopharmacology. Yeah, I love them. Who is not? I love them. I thought about it. I want to get a tattoo of one of these. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, yes, but I'm a yes huge huge Stephen Stahl fan. Um, and so here, here's one of one of his molecules. Um, he doesn't call them that, but here, here are 
uh, yes, here, here's my style of the molecules. They're not, not as, they're not balls, I guess. But um, so you have, um, you know, how, how I'd represent these various uh, mechanisms of action or, or receptor binding affinities for, for various things. So some of them are very similar to how Dr. Stahl represents them, but some are different. And here are uh, Dr. Stahl's uh, neurotransmitters. And this is, this is what I'm doing differently. So basically, here, here's my, my serotonin. So I'm, I'm making the neurotransmitters into molecules, treating them like they're medications. Okay, so okay. it's binding and stimulating all these 5-HT receptors. Uh, dopamine, all the, the D, D receptors, D1, 2, 3, 4. And also it stimulates a, an alpha scepter too, kind of some overlap with uh, norepinephrine af actually. Mm -hmm. And norepinephrine, and I don't know how clinically relevant this is, but it does bind the dopamine receptors with, with a, a weaker affinity than dopamine does, of course. But there is some, some overlap. When I looked into binding affinities, that's just one of the things I discovered. Um, difference between epinephrine and norepinephrine is it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So I got this ring around it. It just won't, won't fit. Uh, acetylcholine, all the muscarinic nicotinic receptors and, uh, histamine of course, um, uh, mm -hmm. stimulates histamine receptors. So these are my neurotransmitter molecules. And for every molecule, we have an anti molecule. So, mm -hmm. uh, serotonin, anti serotonin. So everything that serotonin stimulates this, um, theoretical anti-serotonin would, would block. It's blocking 5-HD2, 3, et cetera. Dopamine, anti-dopamine. It's a, this would mm -hmm. be an antipsychotic. Um, acetylcholine, um, anti-choline, anti-acetylcholine, mm -hmm. which would be, a, yeah, anticholinergic drug and an antihistaminic drug. So antihistamine, which is an inverse agonist, actually. That's what the negative signs are. All right, so we've got all our anti neurotransmitters, and I'm plucking binding affinities off off of these. All right, so we got all these receptor binding affinities. We're recombining them, and that's how we're bioengineering a mm -hmm. molecule drug. Mm -hmm. So, um, so essentially, if one of these uh, binding affinities is blocking D2 receptors, we call it an antipsychotic. Mm -hmm. um, and if it doesn't, we might call it an atypical antidepressant. So this would be mirtazapine, would be a blocker of all of these things. And so, and so what I'm trying to do is kind of make these, the, these receptor binding affinities, these pegs a little, a little more memorable and show how there are a lot of, say, for instance, antipsychotics that have uh, prosocin effect built into them. They have like a built-in prosocin. Mm -hmm. Oh, they are memorable. That's for sure. Yeah. So I'm just, yeah, you know, they don't look as elegant as Dr. Stahl's and I, I don't want to make them, I don't want to make them too cartoonish, but I want them to, yeah, to be something that, it, that at least, you know, help, helps me memorize the drugs that I write mm -hmm. it myself really. I've got a couple other things that I, that I do think that Dr. Stahl's um, images could be improved on. Okay. So here's mm -hmm. fluvoxamine and sertraline um, from Stahl's essential and they look about the same. So you're thinking, okay, there's the only difference between them is that sertraline just uh, blocks dopamine reuptake. It blocks a dopamine transporter very, very lightly, not okay. enough to be called anything other than a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Mm -hmm. They also bind sigma receptors. They're kind of mysterious. Uh, but when I think about them, I really, you know, I think about this effect of fluvoxamine inhibiting all these SIP enzymes, uh, especially 1A2, just very strongly. And so there are all sorts of profound interactions between fluvoxamine and other medications. And it's really, I mean, core to it, to the, the drug's essence, really. This is, this is a booster. It's an in interactor, whereas sertraline, not, you know, not so much. It's not going to be clinically relevant, really, in that regard. So and that's that's why I thought these needed improving on, really. So, um, and so what I'm getting with these molecules that are inhibitors have the up arrow, inducers down, down and delayed, and the ones that are sensitive substrates, so the ones we have to worry about, look out for things interacting with them, um, including genes. If you're a poor metabolizer or a rapid metabolizer, the, the molecules with a hole in it are the ones that you need to be thinking about. And here's what I'm getting with this. So 
um, inhibitors are increasing the substrates with the holes in them and inducers are bringing the levels down like that. So that's how I got a hole. Uh, you got the victim and the perpetrator and <laughs> things that we don't have to worry about that we can just kind of exclude from our analysis uh, are those that are not, not an inhibitor. They're not an inducer. They're not a sensitive substrate. So those make life easy. Um, and this is my final slide. Um, in, in the current book with the, the avatars, the interaction avatars, the things that are non-interactors, not inhibitors, not inducers, not sensitive substrates, they're, they're in a box. So it's in a glass box. There is a hole on the top of it. Maybe something could get in and interact with it in a pharmacokinetic way, but it really not. We just don't have to, to think about that much. So gabapentin, for instance. Hmm. And that's how I memorized all this stuff. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, that was pretty awesome. I, I don't even know what to say after that. I'm still trying to Thank absorb and you. digest all the... Um, all the images and that's pretty cool had we had had this knowledge uh, or we actually gained a knowledge afterwards as a pharmacist or the book oh my god life would have been so much easier absolutely absolutely definitely um, I still remember the drawings on the overhead machine and but that might be a little further back than you Benaz <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um, so my question is this is all great um and so I can see probably students wanting to learn this early on, right? There's uh, clinicians maybe want, uh, obviously want to learn all this, but how are they going to apply it? So I say that because um, it, not even talk about genetics, but just a little bit of the pharmacokinetics and dy dynamics that we saw, there's still a gap between uh, understanding the knowledge, which you did a fabulous job portraying, but then the application of it in a clinical practice. Or do you see a gap there? Or how do you think uh, the gap could be kind of shortened, if that makes sense? Well, for, for one, e EMR integration, I think, is really important. And, you know, when I, when I dealt with these, these tests, I would, I would put the findings in the diagnosis list. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's not the only place that you could put them, at, you know, maybe, you know, in the al allergy section, for oh, instance. Geez. But just mm -hmm. however, it, it just needs to be integrated mm -hmm. so that when you're ordering medications that you have this, mm -hmm. this knowledge, because so, so often I, I see that, that the patient has these results, but for one, we can't find the report. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, it's not like you can order, you know, insurance are going to pay for a second one of these uh, when their sure. genes haven't changed. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just like the data is really useful, but we just sometimes don't have access to it and don't remember that we have it. Sure. So I think that's important to figure that problem out. I think that's where the uh, importance of patients advocating for themselves and, and, you know, educating patients about how to speak up and say, I have these results, <laughs> you know, just a reminder, you, you know, make sure you look at these results and have had several patients that they were in that situation that they were able to advocate for themselves. So just that plug for including the patient. Oh, definitely. And I, t I tell them, Hey, take, you know, when you see a new doctor or if you're, <laughs> if you're hospitalized, take this report okay. with you, you know, right. make some copies. It is important. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you don't, don't tell the doctor, we're not going to know about it because you're admitted to the hospital. You need some medication management. Sure. You, I mean, it's the, you know, these, these tests don't, they're not reported instantly. No. So uh, it just, it's not going to serve any, mm -hmm. any, any purpose there unless you you already have the results and they're ready to go like yeah i'm, I'm just i'm just still, still uh remembering sarah with the the carbamazepine on top <laughs> i think sarah <laughs> sarah was the one that stuck out the most to me all, all yeah. of them did but uh that was my favorite one sarah <laughs> um sarah not type sarah sort of quit of typing thing. quit sarah typing quit typing that's what it was <laughs> yes <laughs> it is working already <laughs> absolutely so you talked yeah. about your um, new book, Dr. Kafer. When can we look for that? Um, our audience, by all means, I'm sure will want to know. So this this one's already out, the one without the molecules. Okay. And okay. some of the pictures, Sarah doesn't look nearly, yeah, it's not nearly as compelling <laughs> with some of the visuals. But uh, so that, that one's out. It's on Amazon. It's pretty popular yeah. among um, 
especially uh, nurse practitioners. Nice. Um, I mean, like in, in nurse tra practitioner training programs, they're mm -hmm. it's just very widely used. Uh, I know pharmacists don't know about it. There's a lot of residency programs using it. Mm -hmm. um, but the new one will come out. I don't know. Um, I'm hoping I'm done with it in a year. <laughs> okay. In a year. Okay. And then, you know, I've got to, you know, get it, get it proofread and reviewed and all. So I, I don't know. But I, I'm saying 2025, okay. all the molecules. We'll hold done. you to that and have you okay. back. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, and that's how I heard about uh, about you. I'm like, oh my god, how do I not know Dr. Kafer by now? That that's crazy. I, I heard from a nurse practitioner who um, pulled it up on a website real quickly. I don't know if it was an app or it was the book <laughs> download or something. And um, that's I remember I learned from a, a nurse practitioner that's like, oh my god, this has saved my life. I'm like, that's uh, that was awesome. Yeah, um, it is. So you, they so in order to get all this information about what type of phenotype they have, which is that um, you talk about ultra rapid or a rapid metabolizer or poor metabolizer, they have to do uh, some kind of uh, genetic testing, I assume, right? Yeah, that, well, unless we can, I mean, sometimes I can predict it, you know, just based on their response to medications. But you, okay. I mean, you really want, you know, somebody who's, you know, have not respond, you know, they haven't responded the expected way to expected medications and they've been having side effects that you wouldn't expect at the given doses and just something's, you know, right. going on. And that's, that's when you want to order one of these. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. Um, I know you talked about a few of the genes there. Um, yeah. I don't remember if I'm, if I, uh, yeah, the pharmacodynamics and kinetic genes. So do you have a favorite one? Um, of those, I think 2D6 is interesting. My favorite gene overall, though, is uh, APOE. Uh, oh, is it? Know, it? Tell us about the Alzheimer's, that. Alzheimer's risk oh, gene, okay. and mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just really into neuroprotection and trying to prevent mm -hmm. dementia. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things out there that have you know in, increase your your risk of dementia, you know, 20 percent or so. And just the idea that if you combine several of these, you know, that that somebody who is at high risk for dementia could could prevent it. Um, lit, lithium is the the big one. I'm a huge fan of, of lithium. And just the more that we're learning about about that, it's mm -hmm. just kind of amazing what it can do, especially with, and we think it's applicable to everyone who might take it, but people with mood disorders, risk of dementia decreased 50%. Oh, um, wow. wow. And just okay. like it. Yeah, just a slowing of the mm -hmm. overall aging process, we think. So some somebody mm -hmm. with a mood disorder on lithium is three times less likely to die in any okay. given year. And like men, for instance, who take it from 55, they're uh, 75 or 70 percent more likely to be alive at age 82. So okay. wow. there's really. Do, I put this, do you put these nuances in, in, your, in your book? Uh, some of that, I, I'm wanting to just write one all about lithium, actually. Mm -hmm. just, I, I, I see it as important. Lithium was popular. For psychiatric. Yeah, it's trendy, yes. Mm -hmm. But for good reason. We yeah. could do a whole episode on lithium because um, yes, there's a very, very famous um, gentleman who is studying longevity and how to live longer and healthier while you're living longer. And lithium is one of the uh, micro doses that he incorporates mm -hmm. into that longevity um, plan yeah. and metformin. <laughs> so, yeah, metformin yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I've had heard point. about micro dosing of lithium as well. Some people uh, mm -hmm. for no other indication, but just a cognition part, oh, cognitive part. Take yeah. it. It's I one of the few that. things that has been, been shown to prevent mild cognitive impairment to from progressing into dementia and okay and it's gotten more when it comes to anti-aging it's it's gotten more mm -hmm. individual mechanisms of of how it would work than any other thing sure. out there i mean sure yeah you know it used to be um micro doses of lithium used to be in seven up I know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, t I talk about that. I, I, uh, I did learn it from, um, I have to make sure I mention his name since that's where I learned it from Dr. Uh, James Greenblatt. He mentioned um, the word seven up because microdoses of lithium was in seven up and, you know, lithium is a natural element in the periodic table and mm -hmm. it has a molecular weight of 6.94, I believe. So they rounded mm -hmm. up to seven. That's how it became seven up. So then he talks about obviously the value of lithium and microdosing of lithium mm -hmm. and 
how he'd prevented it back then from a lot of um, mental health issues. And now, since we don't have it anymore uh, in our um, diet, how that mm-hmm. has increased. So it was a pretty good talk. He's he's awesome. Uh, well, but- some, yeah, some, some places have more of it in their diet than others. Like Northern Texas, they have about 20 times more than we do here in mid-Missouri. That's me. Uh, oh, okay. Um, and <laughs> places, all right. Any particular restaurant? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and so it, it's in the drinking water. It's yeah. in the municipal water supplies. Okay. Um, and places with more lithium in the water have uh, fewer suicides, fewer homicides, mm. less dementia. Uh, so yeah. it does something in microdoses. Yeah. And it's, it's over a long term. Mm-hmm. I don't think microdose is going to do anything for anybody in like a year, but... After many years sure. of exposure, it just makes your um, your brain healthier. Um, and I've got a mnemonic, another mnemonic for you. Yes. So uh, yes, Sarah. it's lithium is the only mood stabilizer approved for use in children, and it's FDA approved for ages seven up. Oh, oh my God! How perfect. <laughs> it's, I wonder. That's awesome. I'm going to use that. Was that intentional? Did they aim I'm for seven and up just because of the seven up dream? <laughs> I don't know. I, no. <laughs> If it, there has know, to be some kind of relation. There has if, it were, to be. If, if I were on the panel at the FDA, yeah, that would, would, yes. we would have done. But most people aren't yeah, worried about <laughs> us memorizing things. But mnemonics, you know, it's just oh like free. God. It's like, you know, memories that are just stored mm-hmm. for free. Because mm-hmm. we'll remember um, that without effort now. I say this with utmost respect. But where were you all our life when we were at pharmacy school? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. But we appreciate you. We really do. This this was really awesome. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, Thank you. We're so grateful. Thank you. It was an honor talking to you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Um, We really appreciate all you're doing, the time you're investing. for because education is so important. So thank you for your investment in others. And um, yeah, Banas. Um, Yeah, thanks for tuning in. And we hope this discussion inspired your curiosity with Sarah. Um, Stay tuned for more scientific insights. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, What what can we teach you? Drop us a line on LinkedIn. We're on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So make sure you um, subscribe and follow us and send us a review. So until next time, think about the power of precision health and pharmacogenomics and how it impacts you and We may just be talking about it on the next episode. Thank you.